Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Tiff Macklem, and I have the great privilege of being the Dean of the Rotman School of Management. The COVID-19 pandemic is overtaking all of our lives. Uh, it is a health emergency, and it is the, the trigger to uh, an emerging economic crisis. At Rotman, our defining purpose is to create value for business and society. And at no time in our history has this been more important than it is today. One of the ways we can do this is by bring, bringing to you the very best in Rotman's management thinking and create a forum to share ideas, share research, and share practical ways we can manage through this crisis. We have experts at Rotman on leadership, on change management, on crisis management, on, on innovation, on how to scale science, uh, on how to lead teams, and all these things and much more uh, are things that we're all going to need to help manage through this crisis. So we've launched this new, uh, this new webinar series. Uh, it's gonna come to you at least once a week. Uh, on, on Friday, or except next week, it's Good Friday, so it'll be Thursday. Uh, and it's called Managing Uncertainty, Adapting and Learning from the COVID-19 COVID Crisis. And our goal is really to bring together the very best from the Rotman community to offer well-informed perspectives on the issues that are top of mind. We're going to share advice for you personally, for your organizations, both strategic and tactical, for managing through the current challenges and helping us all get to the other side of this. Today's inaugural, inaugural webinar is Building Resilience Now, Moving from Coping to Taking Control. And it's anchored by brand new research into the experience of Canadians over the last few weeks. As the title suggests, our focus is on how to meet the personal and professional demands the crisis is making on all of us and how we can restore and maximize our energy and build our resilience to help us get to the other side of this. And I'm thrilled today that we have the two leaders uh, on this project uh, to, to uh, speak to us all. Uh, so let me introduce them. Julie McCarthy is a professor of organizational behavior and human resource management at the University of Toronto Scarborough's Management School uh, and cross appointed to the Rotman School of Management. Julie's work is widely published in leading academic journals, and she conducts leadership and resilience training programs in, in many uh, private and, and public sector organizations. John Trudakos is an associate professor of organizational behavior and human, human resource development. And uh, like Julie, uh, he is he's widely published uh, uh, in the areas of productivity, um, and he is a regular consultant to a broad range of organizations. So welcome again to this inaugural seminar, or webinar, I should say, as we've all gone remote. Uh, and the way this is going to work is that uh, in a second, I'm going to turn it to Julie and John, and they are going to speak uh, for about 15 minutes each. Uh, I'm then going to ask them a few questions, and then I'm going to open it up for your questions. So if you've joined us on Zoom, you can ask questions using the Q&A button on your screen. And uh, I'm, I'm hopeful we can get to as many of those as we can. So I, I want to get right to Julie and John. So with that, uh, Julie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tiff. I'm just going to bring my slides up now. One second here. The hmm. Something is wrong. One sec. <laughs> this was all set up. Okay. Here we go. Hmm. Now I'm having problems. We, we saw them. Okay. It's the wrong slide, Dad. Sorry, back end. <laughs> saw something. Starting with technical issues. 
Um, let me try once more here. Share my screen. There we go from the beginning. Okay, something happened with the text, but that's okay. Um, welcome everybody, and thank you very much, Tim, for the introduction. I apologize for the technology glitch, everyone, um, but thank you for being here today. Um, my colleague John and I have prepared the next 30 minutes um, of talking to really give you a sense of concrete strategies that you can use to gain control and navigate the new normal during this very challenging time. And I'd like to start by asking, um, we're gonna do a bit of an interactive poll with the audience today. And I want everybody to um, answer the following question. How would you describe your current level of stress and anxiety? From extremely high, high, moderate, low, or extremely low? So right now, like over the past week, over the past little while, how anxious and stressed have you been? Now you can see from this question that um, one of the big things that we're gonna be talking about today is the stress and anxiety that Canadians are experiencing and the importance of gaining control and actual concrete strategies we can use to combat this stress, rejuvenate our energy and build our resilience. So we'll give a minute to see if the poll is actually, if the figures are coming in. I can see it on my screen. Can't quite see what's happening with the poll. So hopefully people are responding. I know there are a lot of you out there, so thank you for joining us from all over the place. I wonder if it's possible to share the answer of the polls up to date. So Julie, this, uh, the, the poll is in, uh, extremely high is 5%, high is 34%, moderate is 46%, low 13%, extremely low is 2%. Okay, are we able to share that on a screen? with the uh, Yes, it's currently sharing. Oh, everybody can see it. Sorry, I can't see it. So um, my apologies. Um, I guess because I'm speaking and my slides are up, I'm unable to see those numbers. Um, okay, so the extremely high was um, what percentage? Moderate by 46%. Wow, okay. So what I would like to tell everybody is that you're not alone. We know that even before COVID, 58% of Canadians reported excessive stress every day at work. We also know that over $320 billion a year was spent on stress-related illness in North America alone. Um, and we can see from these figures right now, um, many of us are experiencing high, extremely high or moderate levels of stress. Now today, um, those numbers are even worse, as I said. And as we mentioned, John and I are in the process. We launched a very large scale study of well being with workers from across Canada. We launched it about two weeks ago, and we have over 700 workers that we're tracking for the next three months. And we want to share some of the preliminary findings of what we're seeing from people across Canada. The first thing that we're seeing um, is that, first of all, stress levels are a very big concern. So we see one of our anonymous participants says stress levels are higher, more worried about family's health and financial future, feeling increased pressure to perform as a parent and professionally. A second participant talked about uncertainty and lack of control, saying that the uncertainty of job loss due to nothing in my control has taken over all aspects of my life. Now, as you can see, these quotes are powerful illustrations of the complexities that Canadians are experiencing right now. And what we'd like to do is I'm going to start off today by talking about how we can control our energy. Within that, I'll talk about conserving and replenishing resources and maximizing our work recovery. My colleague, John, will then come in and talk about controlling our time, talking about motivation and autonomy, interruptions, and how we can optimize our work breaks. In terms of conserving and replenishing resources, it's incredibly important for us to do this on a daily basis. Each one of us has a finite amount of energy that we need to rejuvenate and replenish daily. 
This helps avoid burnout and build resilience. Resilience in order to deal with the pressures and challenges that we're facing today more than ever. Now we can do this in a number of areas, but two of the areas I would like to touch on this morning are healthy habits and interpersonal connections. We'll start with our healthy habits. Here are a couple of quotes from our participants so far. The first talks about sleep. My lack of sleep is causing me to be more anxious and feel unwell. And the second one, before COVID, I would be up at 6 a.m. and begin my training regiments. I feel as if I have broken routine, and this is putting me into a slump. We can see that now more than ever, Canadians are finding it challenging to engage in healthy habits. I'd like to talk for a moment about the science of sleep. We know that sleep is incredibly important. It enables resource recovery and it's directly linked to our mood states. In fact, a lack of sleep is strongly related to levels of depression and anger. We also know that sleep is highly related to the productivity and quality of our work. COVID-19 and increased work and family demands have made it so that many Canadians are finding it very difficult to get the duration and the quality of sleep that they need. Many of us may be experiencing high levels of insomnia and restlessness, and now it's more important than ever to try to ensure that we're rejuvenating our energy through sleep. Now, the experts say we should be striving for seven to eight hours a night. With many of us, our schedules have kind of flipped upside down, and so you may also now be able to consider getting naps in throughout the day if you can't get those seven to eight hours at night. Now, when napping, be careful. We know that we need to keep a nap under 30 minutes. Otherwise, over 30 minutes, we can get into deep REM sleep, and it becomes even more exhausting when we wake. It's also critical to defend our last hour before bed. There have been many, many studies over the past few years showing that, that blue, the blue light from our cell phones and other devices actually interferes with melatonin production, making it more difficult to get into deep sleep states. So minimum that last hour before bed, really critical to unwind and reduce that screen time. We know that we should be keeping our rooms cool and dark to help promote deep levels of sleep and waking up and going to bed at the same time. When we study individuals on shift work and um, you know, who are altering their schedules, we know that this can be incredibly depleting um, because it interferes with our circadian rhythms. So to the extent that you have control over this, trying to maintain consistent sleep schedules is incredibly important for rejuvenating your energy. Let's talk for a moment about exercise. Exercise, we know, stimulates chemicals that feed our brain, endorphins and serotonin. It also lowers the risk of illness and disease, and it alleviates depression and anxiety. In fact, it can make us happy. Again, with fitness, many Canadians are finding it challenging to fit fitness in. Recreation facilities and sports complexes are closed. Um, maybe some of the gyms and places where we used to go and work out have also been shut down. But there's many ways that we can exercise within the confines of our homes. For example, there's many online programs and really creative and unique things popping up um, with people engaging in interactive exercise activities via virtual networks. Some other creative things, home gym crawls. So one family I know decided that each individual in the house would be responsible for creating a different exercise in a different room and using creative materials, things like um, soup cans for free weights and nylons for resistance bands and dishcloths for gliding and doing um, gliding sorts of exercises. They created different rooms with different exercises, making it fun. Some of us may be lucky to have desk treadmills or exercise equipment within the home. So we need to dust it off and start to use it. But even if we don't, simply walking in place. So when you're on the phone, you know, and, and people um, may or may not necessarily see you, simply engaging in walking while you're in meetings is incredibly productive. And finally, goal setting charts. Here at the Rotman Business School, we have Gary Latham, who's the founder of goal setting theory. And we know from hundreds of studies of goal setting that simply putting up a chart and setting goals and trying to achieve those um, is enormously productive. We can make this fun by including our family members and making it a little competitive. 
Interpersonal connections are also incredibly rejuvenating and they build our energy and resources. I have a recent paper that focuses on the tend and befriend phenomenon, which is that in times of stress, humans have an innate tendency to reach out and protect those within their groups. We do this with family members. You know, we have a tendency to want to protect our loved ones. Leaders and managers do this with their teams, an innate tendency to want to protect their groups. And with COVID, this is a worldwide situation. And we're seeing enormous levels of care and concern across all uh, walks of life and with many different people, which is incredibly refreshing. In New York City, this past weekend, as an example, at 7 p.m., they had a campaign called Clap Because We Care, where New York uh, and people living in New York leaned out their windows, they opened their windows, and they clapped for all of the essential service workers who are doing such an amazing time um, helping in this incredible time. COVID-19, we know, has led to increased physical distance, but it hasn't necessarily led to increased social distance. You see my picture of the Brady Bunch, it maybe will give you an indication of my age, but I know for me, lots of different family members and friends and groups are reaching out to engage in what you see on this cell phone, these chat times, you know, maybe in the evening with some girlfriends, you know, having some wine. Um, and it kind of reminds me of the, the old Brady Bunch introduction. Um, and it's incredibly facilitative. Here are some examples from our anonymous participants. My team at work have become closer than we ever could have imagined. Everyone from line level to my managers, all looking out for one another. Another example, spending a lot of time staying in touch through group messages for friends and video chats with family. I feel connected to people digitally, but also because we're all going through the same situation together. Now, there's some important caveats when we talk about maintaining and building these interpersonal connections. And the first is emotional contagion. We know that emotions spread very quickly from one individual to another. So when we feel happy, that smile can prompt a very quick smile and spread happiness around a room, like the dominoes that you see to the right. At the same time, negative emotions spread very quickly. So fear and anxiety can quickly lead to outright panic. Being aware of this, the fact that emotions are contagious is incredibly important in today's time, particularly if you're in a position of power. So if you're a leader or a manager, you're setting the tone. When you start that meeting, and if there's levels of fear and anxiety, that can permeate very quickly through your group. It's important to stay calm and collected, to help minimize levels of panic and stress among our workforces. We also want to block that negative and try to bring in positive emotions to the extent that we can. Mode of communication is also incredibly important. Um, with technology, it's amazing that we can engage in these interactive video chats and FaceTimes. It's a really rich mode of communication that allows us to connect in real time and also to be able to see the expressions and reactions of those who we're talking with, providing valuable information on how they may be feeling and what they might be thinking. At the same time, we need to recognize that this is incredibly, it can be emotionally demanding that when people are engaged in these online team calls, they're managing their impressions, you know, they're trying to control their expressions and emotions. And so as leaders and family members and members of society, we want to make sure that we don't overburden and overtax people with consistent, constant video calls. And so we want to ask ourselves, is, are the goals matching our medium? For example, maybe for a certain meeting, it's not necessarily um, important that we all see each other every single meeting every day. And we can go back to kind of some old school phone calls that are mixed in to minimize the stress levels of people we're interacting with. Now my work and the work of John Trugakos and others has shown that it's not enough to just get the physical and the social rejuvenation that in order to really regain energy and maximize our resources, we need to couple this with mental recovery. So if we're exercising and we're on that treadmill and we're Googling for the 50th time updates on COVID-19, we're actually not capitalizing on that recovery experience. If we're exercising, try to detach your brain, 
try to be able to actually relax and avoid the rumination. Maybe selecting activities that you truly enjoy or engaging in activities with family members or friends so that you can really have your mind in the now. If you're relaxing and you go out onto your porch first thing in the morning, you know, to have a cup of coffee and try to de-stress from what's happening, again, it's really important to clear your mind. We can engage in mindfulness strategies like breathing exercises. We can minimize social news and media channels um, and try to balance that with positive things that are happening. And if we're socializing, so it's Friday night and we get on that call with our friends and we're spending the entire time talking about stress and negative things, it's not as rejuvenating. So trying to balance it. And people have been finding amazing ways of getting creative through interactive games and even dress up theme parties um, to help alleviate some stress. Putting it all together, What's really important is that we need to take care of ourselves. We need to have the physical rejuvenation. We need to build those interpersonal connections um, with the social rejuvenation. And even more, we need to do those things while at the same time mentally detaching on a daily basis. I talked about doing this in three areas, exercise, relaxing, and socializing. And we know from research that this leads directly to resilience giving us the capacity to be able to increase our ability to combat the stresses and the pressures that we're facing. Thank you all so very much. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, John, and he's going to talk about controlling our time. Okay, thanks, Julie, and everybody just bear with me for one quick second while I get the slides up here on my side to take control of the deck. Um, okay, so... Um, for my part of the presentation, I'm going to be focusing on ways in which we can take control of our time, um, and in particular, the important roles that autonomy and motivation, uh, as well as strategic scheduling play in helping us to boost these feelings of control and motivation. Uh, before I go into details, though, let's turn back to what some of our participants, Canadians uh, participating in our study, uh, have said to us about these themes that we're looking at. First person said, I'm dealing with feelings of helplessness. Usually, I want to plan and control every aspect of my life. And in the face of adversity, I will simply work harder and smarter. In this situation, I cannot outsmart a virus. And the unknowns come in waves of anxiety. Clearly, this person is hitting on a main theme of our presentation today and something that a lot of people are experiencing. And that is the lack of control that we have because of the situation that we're in. So, Hopefully, through this presentation, you'll learn some ways, small ways, to take some of that control back. Our second person says, as a person who normally works outside of a regular office setting, it's hard being indoors all day. Working from home makes Monday to Friday feel vastly different. It's hard to get motivated and stay on work tasks. This quote's representative of a, another theme we're seeing in our, uh, our feedback we're getting from Canadians, and that is how the current situation and changes in the way we're having to do things can pose uh, a challenge for people in staying motivated. So how can we get some of these feelings of autonomy and motivation back during times of uncertainty? Well, autonomy, of course, is that sense of control we have, our ability to do things the way we want to do them. We know autonomy is important because it reduces stress, reduces energy drain, makes us feel empowered, and in turn, this leads to motivation for us. Now, we can think of autonomy, you know, how much how, what a role it plays in our energy. For example, if we think about a task that you would like to do, you prefer to do, it's your choice to do, and how much more easy it is for you to engage and have the energy in that task compared to a task that someone is forcing you to do or you feel forced to do. Uh, it's a lot more taxing to do that task that you feel forced to do. So it's important to regain a sense of control and autonomy, even if just for that reason. But it also helps our motivation. And of course, we know motivation is that force that drives us. Uh, it increases our energy. It increases our capacity to be productive. And this is really important when we're working under different circumstances than what we might be used to. So how can we boost our sense of autonomy and improve our motivation? Well, one way we can do this is through strategic scheduling. We know that many of us are facing increased demands on our time and attention. And this is, being ha this is happening under increased constraints because of the COVID crisis. This leads to 
people feeling higher sense of anxiety, panic, fear, uh, distractibility, helplessness, even guilt. And so what can we do to help reduce some of these feelings and gain a sense of control back? It starts simply with our schedules and being able to make a plan. Now, Julie already talked about goal setting, but this is really important. Every day you should go in to each day with a plan, set a plan, even if it's something as simple as a to-do list that you make for yourself that you check off as you go along. In order to achieve your plan, what you need to do is figure out ways to create boundaries. Now, a lot of people are in unique settings. They have more demands. Maybe they're working from home. And so this leads to some unique challenges to how to do this. Well, in setting boundaries, we wanna make sure there's boundaries for work and boundaries for home and find ways that we can be productive during the day. This makes us think about, well, what are ways that we can work better? We'll talk about that. But also figuring out the optimal times that we can work. And so we'll talk about kind of what our body rhythms tell us are the best times to work. But also you have to think about, well, we're working maybe differently than we're ever used to. And so finding windows and periods of the day that we can be productive is really important. Um, part of helping us maintain our control and being effective is to learn how to minimize interruptions and the cost that they take. And of course, something that people kind of think about, but maybe don't really strategically think about, and that is how do we take breaks to maximize our productivity and how do we plan these breaks? Once again, let's see what our participants across Canada are saying about their schedules, the interruptions they're dealing with, and their ability to, to take breaks. Sorry, the slide went one across there. So one of our participants said, working from home has been more difficult than I had thought it would be. I get distracted, my son is also home, and it makes it difficult to focus. This is a clear example of someone who's dealing with distractions that they're maybe not used to, a different schedule than they're used to, and we see the challenges that they face. And this is representative of a number of comments that we had throughout our, our survey so far. A second person says, I just have to remember when working from home to take breaks, get up and move around, and not work additional hours for free. I have to learn to work my scheduled shift and no more. Again, this is, sounds like someone who has uh, realized they're dealing with some, some of these issues and has acknowledged the importance of figuring out how to take breaks and incorporating them into the workday, which is a great step in a dealing with the situation that we're in. So let's jump into these themes a little bit more deeply. It's obvious to most of us that interruptions, or what I like to call the science of unwanted breaks, are detrimental to our productivity. But it goes beyond just the time we lose when we're dealing with the interruption itself. You know, so someone comes in, they interrupt you, and obviously that time that they're distracting you, you are not getting the work that you need to get done. But research also shows that there's a hidden cost to interruptions. And this is what is called restart costs. So this is especially important to recognize is that when you're interrupted, it can take your brain about up to 15 to 20 minutes to get back mentally to where you were after stopping your work. So for example, stopping to check email, it can lead you to having not just the time that you're off your task, but also that 15 to 20 minute period to mentally bring yourself back to peak performance. Before the COVID crisis, people were constantly checking your phones and all the electronics that we have were a big distraction for us. In fact, research shows that on average, people check their phones about 46 times a day, which is quite a distracting factor if you think about it. Since COVID, and through our data collection, we have uh, recognized another distraction, and that is the news that people are following on COVID. Our data indicates that people are spending about three and a half hours a day on COVID-related news. So again, a unique distraction to the situation and obviously taking quite a bit of, uh, and understandably so, quite a bit of time out of people's day. Now, some people might think, okay, um, you know, I'm an expert at multitasking, no problem, and the more I multitask, the better I'm gonna get. Well. Uh, unfortunately, you're probably not right about that. The research shows us that not only are people not very good at multitasking, but unlike a lot of things that we think, well, you know, we practice a lot of things, we get better. Multitasking is not one of these things. We generally do not get better with practice on multitasking. So it's really important to focus in on the critical tasks that you're doing, do them one at a time, get them done, and move on to the next thing. Okay. So with this in mind, let's do another one of our interactive polls. In this case, I'd like you to tell us how often do you actually schedule or plan your work breaks on a daily basis? Remember, there really are no right or wrong answers here. Um, no one knows what your response is. We just see the overall average of the responses that people are producing, as you saw in the first poll. 
And really think about this, you know, how many people actually do schedule their break? And we'll talk about kind of why this concept is important as we move along. So I'll give you a few minutes here to get your answers locked in and we'll put up the results once we kind of close it. We kind of give you a little more extra time here. And hopefully we can uh, take some of that information and see how we can do better on breaks as we kind of move forward through the rest of this presentation. So let's go ahead, everybody get your answers in. And I see we have our results. Now, not surprisingly, majority of people are in the rarely to never category. And this is not surprising because we don't really think about breaks that often. And with kind of this information that you've provided us in mind, let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about the science of breaks and what we can do to improve them and how we can maximize our effectiveness throughout the day. So what do we know? Research tells us that people are productive in about 90 minute intervals. That is whether it's in work settings, musical orchestras, sports settings, the maximum that we can expect people to perform at a reasonably high level is 90 minutes. After that, people need a 15 to 20 minute break in order to recharge before they can go into another performance episode. Other data tells us that the most top 10 most productive people in organizations, top 10% of most productive people in organizations, take about 17 minutes of break for every 52 minutes of work they do. Now, this is kind of interesting if you think about it, because we think, well, our top performers must work themselves continually until they pass out at the end of the day, you know, and drag themselves away from their work. But we actually see that the best performers do something different. They work in relatively short, high efficient, productive bursts, and they take relatively long breaks to recharge themselves for their next performance episode. So it's important to keep these things in mind. So what are some other things we can do? So we talked about planning your day, not just the tasks we do, and everybody plans their, uh, you know, meetings and plans the things they have to get done, but they don't really probably sit down and plan their breaks, but you wanna plan your breaks and you wanna schedule your day in a way that you can work these in to maximize your efficiency. So what does this mean? We know our circadian rhythms tend to make most people effective mentally in the morning. Now for early risers, this might shift a little bit earlier and for night owls, this might shift a little bit later, but generally speaking, our mental peak is kind of this morning time period before lunch, and this is when we want to do our most critical mental tasks. After this point, it's important to take a break and not just any break, but take your, this is the natural time we take lunch breaks. And then, you know, when I give a talk to people, I put up that iconic picture of the workers over the New York skyline, right? Sitting there, and I'm sure you can envision that picture, but that's very important to get away from your work, stop what you're doing um, and take that break. And yes, people do study lunch breaks. In fact, I published a paper on lunch break that says it's really important to leave work behind, detach, relax, and recover from work. We know that we're at our lowest kind of energy points between 2 and 3 p.m. Now, this is important to uh, keep in mind because this is not the time that you want to be doing your most important tasks. I mean, even countries around the world that practice siesta or nap time, this is kind of the period they do it, and it makes sense why. Um, if you're going to take a nap, like Julie said, and you have the luxury of doing that, this is the time to do it, maybe a 20-minute nap, and then do things that are kind of, you know, if you don't have that luxury, do things that are maybe mundane or routine that don't require your peak mental effectiveness. We then get another energy boost between 4 and 5 p.m. Um, it's related to a productivity boost now. I kind of joke that, well, this is the time of day where people have procrastinated a lot of things during the workday and kind of are realizing the end of the workday is coming and better take action quickly to not look like you were doing nothing all day. But we do have that boost of energy there, and so it's a good time to take advantage of that. Also, research shows us not to wait to take breaks. The earlier in the day we take our breaks, the better. If people are waiting until lunch or even after lunch to take a break, you get closer and closer to the bottom of your energy barrel, and it gets harder to do, do the tasks that you're going to do, and the break you take only brings you partway back up. If you're taking breaks earlier, that recharges you, brings you back to your peak energy level, and then you never get to the bottom of the barrel on your energy. Finally, Research I've done shows that you should do what you want to do. And this gets back to our idea of control. Our breaks are our own personal time, or they should be at least. And we should do things that we prefer to do during these times. And the extent that we do this makes the breaks more energizing for us. So 
So let's just quickly talk about a few different kinds of breaks you can take throughout your day. Um, first are micro breaks. These are 20 to 30 second breaks where you kind of stand up, stretch and move around, uh, get away from your workstation or whatever the work you're doing is. This helps you relieve muscle tension and it's something that should be done about every 20 to 30 minutes if possible. Short rest breaks. These are about five to 20 minutes long. These come after the performance episodes we were talking about previously. And here you wanna detach from work, get away, maybe move around, get your body moving, but try to recharge yourself and, and, and leave that work behind for a good five to even up to 20 minutes potentially. And then finally, um, lunch breaks, which we've also talked about, about 30 to 60 minutes, get that healthy food inside of you, do something you enjoy to do and recover yourself for your next part of your work day. It's also really important to create a supportive culture. And this can be both in the workplace as well as home related to taking breaks and recovering ourselves and keeping ourselves healthy. Now, about this time a year ago, we were beginning to embark on a wonderful sports journey in our country. And of course, I'm talking about the championship of our beloved Toronto Raptors. And what is interesting is that the Raptors, by and large, won the championship because they engaged in a load management or rest program for their best player. And what they realize is that even the best need to rest. And so by creating strategic rest opportunities for their best player, it allowed him to be at peak effectiveness when we needed him the most, and that was to win the championship. So if it's good enough for the Raptors to win a championship, why not us? So I'd like right now everybody to take a minute, take out your phones, take out your calendars, or if you don't have those handy, maybe write down a piece of paper or open your mental schedule. And right now, go ahead. I hope you're taking them out and actually doing this. Go ahead and schedule your break for tomorrow, right? Schedule a time for you to recover tomorrow, whether that's a 10 minute, a 15 minute break, a lunch break, whatever it is, actually put that in your calendar, schedule it and take that time to do what you want. Take control of part of your day right there and re-energize yourself in your day. I'd like to give the last word of our presentation to one of our anonymous participants. And this is something that we came across in some of the comments we were getting, and we found it to be very profound for the time that we're in. I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy. We will get through this. And yes, together we will, we will all get through this. I hope what we've presented today will give you an opportunity to take a little bit of control back to help make this a little bit easier for you and help you have small strategies that can help you get through this as well. Julie and I would like to thank you all for joining us today. And we would like to thank the Rotman team for putting this together and our Dean Tiff, as well as the whole leadership group at the University of Toronto for leading our school through these challenging times. We'd also like to thank our great research team, including Nitya Chala, our international collaborator, as well as our wonderful students and research assistants who have helped with this project. The University of Toronto really does have some of the very best students in the world. I'd now like to turn it back over to Tiff and our moderators for our question period. John and Julie, you've, you've given us uh, a bunch of very practical, practical tips on how to help manage uh, our, our anxiety and, and stay resilient and healthy through this. Uh, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to say it. Uh, there, there's a lot of practical challenges, particularly when we're all stuck at home. And so I'm going to push you a little bit on, on some of these. Um, but before I get there, a couple of things. One is uh, I'm thrilled to see the questions are coming in and we're gonna to get to your uh, questions from the audience. Uh, one question that we're getting a lot is, will this, uh, will this webinar be available um, after? And it is, it's being recorded and uh, it will be available. So you can, you can share it with your friends uh, and uh, get, the, get this practical advice out there. Uh, I'm gonna share one, one story, one personal story. Um, in the last big crisis, the global financial crisis, I was Canada's G7 finance deputy, and I was very involved in the response, uh, government response to the crisis. And I had a large team working for me. And in the weeks after, immediately after the failure of Lehman, I, I worked like a maniac. I tended to think I was indestructible. And the reality is I, I, did, I did just, I, I wore myself out. And at one point, I started to realize the fact that I, I looked terrible, my voice was getting really deep. Uh, it was starting to, to stress out the people around me. 
Uh, and so I, I decided, okay, I've, I've got to do something about this. So I, I, I actually left work right, right at five o'clock. Uh, I went home. I didn't do anything that evening. I got eight hours sleep. And the next day I came to work and I, I put on like my best suit with my whitest shirt and my nicest tie. And I just went around and smiled at everybody all day. And it was amazing how quick, like the immediate reaction to that. I could just see everybody just felt better. They were more focused in their work. And it was like the team was coming together and like, okay, we're going to get through this. I, I was stunned by just how just in, in, in a very short period that the impact that would have. And so, Julie, I want to start off with you. Um, you, you talk about uh, emotional contagion and how negative emotions spread and pull us all down. Um, you know, the reality is we're all dealing with a lot of stress and anxiety, and, and we have to talk to we have to talk to somebody about that. I mean, how do we balance this need to talk about our stress without dragging everybody down? Okay, excellent question. Um, and I agree completely that during times of stress, we do need to engage in what we would call in the literature emotion focused coping. And so emotion focused coping is when individuals feel high levels of stress, we want to reach out to other individuals to commiserate to have somebody to listen to what we're going through to have, you know, a shoulder to cry on, so to speak. Um, and this is a natural tendency and it can it can be very facilitative. Um, and so it serves a really important purpose. And so when we're feeling these high levels of stress, reaching out and talking about our anxieties and our concerns is important up to a point. And so what happens is if we're overdoing this and in all of our conversations or, you know, we're having these conversations with different groups and it's continuously focusing on the negative, that's when it becomes rumination. And so there's kind of this balance between reaching out to others and gaining that support, but also trying to balance that with not allowing it to get into a rumination phase, which is incredibly detrimental. Um, so we need to think about this as leaders and managers with our people when they're reaching out to us with high levels of stress, really being able to listen to their concerns and their needs and help them through that but at the same time, not constantly focusing on that and really trying to bring some of the positivity um, in any area really in that we, uh, that we can. Thank you. Um, John, I'm gonna turn it to you now. One of the questions we're getting from many people in the audience is one of the additional challenges of this crisis is we're all working at home. So uh, it's very hard to separate work and and home life, uh, and you know, there's a lot going on in our home lives as well as a lot going on at work. Do you have any practical advice to try to create some boundaries between work and, 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 and home? Yeah, sure. Um, there's a lot of things that people could think about. Obviously, this is an unprecedented time for a lot of people. And so, first of all, is having patience, right? Knowing that things are not going to be perfect in the way that we um, were used to doing things. And so that goes a long way. But it starts off also with communicating. Uh, both people at work that, hey, you know, things are a bit different. Share with your manager or your colleagues what your situation is. If you've got three kids running around you at home and, you know, two dogs or whatever, sure, you might be interrupted sometimes. And I think we're a little more understanding during these times. But, you know, communicate with people and let them know what you're dealing with. Same thing with your family members. You know, being able to sit down with your family members and say, okay, I've got to get this and this and this done today. Let's go ahead and make a plan so that we're a team together. You know, if you're working with you know, you're living with your family members or your roommates or whatever it might be, make, be a team on this and come up with ways that you can solve the problems and make sure everyone's as productive as possible. The other thing is, is being able to create, um, you know, good times to work. So set out, make it clear what your times to work are. And then even creating physical barriers can be important. So if you have an office to work in at home or another floor that you can go on to, or even something, putting a baby gate up, you know, to block yourself off, to let people know this is kind of my work time in my space or a rope or a tape or whatever you have to do just to give an indication that, hey, there's a barrier here. Um, and this is, you know, this is now work time. I think those are just kind of practical, simple ways um, that we can create a little bit of these boundaries in almost kind of boundaryless type situations that people are facing sometimes. Uh, some good tips. I, I like to the, the create some physical space. It's, it's, uh, we, are, we are so physical. Um, Julie, I'm going to come back to you. You talked a lot about sleep and exercise. Mm -hmm. The other important thing in, in life is food. Uh, <laughs> you know, 
any any practical advice on on the, the role food plays and what we need to be thinking about in, in terms of eating and, and making sure that uh, you know how does that contribute to our well-being? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think food is really essential. And we know that um, healthy eating replenishes our energy and it stimulates uh, brain development. And in fact, in our study, we did ask also about food preferences and what's happening. And one of the things that we're finding in the current crisis is that many people are engaging in emotional eating, which is common with stress and anxiety. Um, so some individuals are overeating. Some individuals in our sample indicated that they're under eating, that they're not hungry. Um, and many talked about binge eating, um, snacks, and you know, all the simple carbohydrates. Um, I think we know that food is incredibly replenishing when we're eating healthy, and so we want to make sure that we're doing that. Um, and in terms of healthy eating, I would say Canada recently, finally, came out with its new food guide late last year. Um, and the Government of Canada website has a really good resource that walks you through. It's quite comprehensive. Um, some of the changes, you know, they're really highlighting water intake. The fruits and veggies categories have increased. But I would recommend to people taking a look at that. Also really minimizing your simple carbs. So those cookies and donuts and you know that kind of binge eating at this time. Um, a good example, my husband's a type one diabetic. And so living as a researcher, I'm kind of watching everything. And what happens um, with a diabetic is if their blood sugars in a day are kind of going up and down consistently, you know, maybe you're traveling, maybe something's happened with stress or, you know, so they're not as under control it's incredibly depleting. So the, the depletion of resources is amazing. And so it's in, enormously exhausting. And for those of us who are fortunate, we're not type one diabetics, a similar function happens to a bit of a lesser degree in that when we eat these foods that are really rich in, in um, simple carbohydrates, we get a boost of you know, sugar, of energy. But then when we come down, we become more depleted than we were before. And so we need to be really careful about maintaining those consistent levels of energy by not having these crazy food bursts up and down throughout the day and by really trying to eat healthy. Um, I think with COVID, we've seen some really amazing things with food. And so we've seen um, all of these creative cooking things. You know, one of my girlfriends recently started a Facebook interactive program where people can share recipes and ideas um, my daughter is 14 and um, a couple of days ago my husband and I were working in our office and unbeknownst to us she was watching a TikTok video and making homemade pasta on her own. And so I think some people, you know, we have some of us time at home with our families. We should be focusing on creative and healthy cooking, trying to make it fun and really trying to keep those energy levels up. Lots of good advice there. I can see I'm going to have to cut back on the cookies, though. Yes. Um, but, but I'm glad you mentioned the Canadian Food Guide. I, I think, you know, the old food guide, you know, there'd be like all these units with so many units of protein and so many. Yeah. Units. Who knew what a, a unit was? I love the way they've done it now. You just, the visual is a plate. And right. And the plate is fruits and vegetables. A quarter of the plate is protein and a quarter of the plate is grains. It's just really easy to... Yeah rather than counting all these damn units, just think, you know, half the stuff you eat is food and vegetables. Yeah, uh, exactly. Um, John, I'm going to come back to you. One of the questions, we're getting a lot of questions about breaks. Um, I think people are very interested to know how long should breaks be? And in particular, how do you, do you have any tips um, to move from break back into work? And, and how do we make that transition as efficient as possible? So, so we can find time to take these breaks that we're probably not taking. Sure. Well, first of all, I'm going to do what Julie said and keep hydrated. <laughs> Be a good example of the research we're talking about. Um, yeah. So in terms of getting back from your break, I mean, it's the same kind of mentality as when you leave your work and you leave that work behind. When you get back to work, leave your break behind. Right. So forget about what you were doing on the break. Get back in and get refocused. Um, some colleagues of mine and I recently completed a study looking at reattachment to work after a break. And so what we see from that is that it's really appropriate when you sit back down from a break, whether it's coming to work in the morning or kind of throughout the day, to take two to five minutes 
to refocus yourself and mentally reconnect to your work. You know, that can be re-going over your plan, thinking about what your strategy is going to be for that upcoming episode that you're going to be working on, the things you have to get done, the order in which you're going to work on them. So taking just a couple of minutes right at the beginning of a work episode to refocus and reattach yourself uh, to your work is really important, right? And then, of course, put aside the distractions. You know, you have your phone, you have your emails. Um, you know, I know colleagues, there are some colleagues that won't answer email until the workday is over, you know, in the hour of the workday, and that makes them super productive. And now people don't have that luxury, obviously, but kind of come up with strategic uh, plans to do this uh, so that your outside distractions don't come into your, uh, your time that you're trying to be productive in that. Um, so the question that we're getting probably more than any other question from the audience, and I, I'm going to turn to both of you, I'll start with you, Julie, and come back to you, John, is... Uh, you, you've given some really good practical advice to manage our own stress and our own anxiety. Uh, many of the people in the audience are, are managers of groups, and, and the common question is, what can we do to try to uh, you know, de-stress and, and manage the anxiety that, that obviously our, the people that work for us are, are uh, facing? Julie, I'll start with you. Okay, absolutely. Um, yeah, this is really important. I touched on it a little with the emotional contagion. So first of all, recognizing that emotions are contagious. So to the extent that you can have a very calm and collected demeanor and bring in some positive, that can help a lot. I think it's also really important um, to understand that everybody's anxieties are different. And so as leaders and managers, um, we would use what we call individualized consideration. And so really trying to get an understanding of what is driving the stress and anxiety, because it's likely that it's actually quite different from one of your employees to the other. And so communication is incredibly important and, and really getting an understanding of what are the underlying causes of that. Um, the other thing that I would say is that there are resources. So it's my understanding that right now, um, if the levels of stress and anxiety are beyond, like incredibly high, um, it's my understanding that even within Ontario at least, there are clinical psychologists and groups that are starting to offer counseling services for individuals. Um, I think it's really important to use the expertise of these professionals who are really trained to manage these really high levels of stress and anxiety that for individuals who are in situations where they may need um, even more individualized consideration. John, I'll yeah. Yeah, just to follow up on that too, I mean, communication is very important and patience with your, with your workforce. Um, really lay out to them what the expectations are and, and let people know it's okay that you don't have all the answers, mm -hmm. it's okay that things are going to be different. Um, I think being there for your employees that you're managing at this time is a big thing. Sometimes they just need someone to raise concerns to and let that get out there. Um, you know, finding ways to keep your team connected. And I think we'll have a, a, one of our colleagues is going to maybe be talking about managing teams uh, you know, in coming, in coming webinars. Um, and then, you know, they the saying like, don't sweat the small stuff. I mean, it can be any kind of things that you can freak out about. I mean, I think the other day I was replacing toilet paper and one fell in the toilet and all I could think of myself was, oh no, I've just lost a critical resource here. And then I was like, wait a minute, that's, you know, it's one roll of toilet paper. Let's just be realistic. And that mentality is what I'm, you know, trying to slowly take to the other things I'm dealing with, you know, because things are not going to go the, as smoothly or as the way they went before and celebrate the wins. I mean, that's another thing. When you do have successes, make a big deal out of them. Uh, let people know that, you know what, there's some things that are going to be different. Some things are still going to go on the way we, uh, you know, normally would do them and celebrate the success that you have as a team and mm -hmm. able to, to, to do this. Um, another question we're getting a lot from the audience is, um, we, we all know your research is only a few weeks old, and so it's pretty early uh, in this project. But are there any... Are you seeing any uh, things that really surprised you? You know, are people coming together? Are they coming apart? Are, are, there, are there things that you wouldn't have predicted given that this, this situation is so unprecedented? It's not a normal kind of workplace environment. John, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we're seeing kind of a theme of people looking to get socially engaged. And I don't know that that's super surprising, but the level at which people are looking to help each other out there is, is encouraging, uh, I think. Um, you know, some of the uh, ways in which people are getting creative, you know, we're getting some of the feedback we're getting is different creative ways they're 
getting through their day or getting their work done or coming up with creative things with their family. You know, a lot of people are mentioning how this actually in some ways is turning into a bit of a positive for them because they're reconnecting with their family members and having extra time that maybe they wouldn't have. Um, so in addition to the challenges they face, and we, we get these kind of comments where like, on one hand, there's all these challenges, but on the other hand, we're doing this, these things together as a family, or people are reaching out to each other that maybe they haven't heard from in some time, right? You know, I mean, uh, people that some people haven't talked with for a couple of years are now video chatting with and reconnecting with people because they feel that need to be closer to people and to, to connect. So I think those are some of the, um, you know, some of the positives and some of the unexpected things that we're taking out of this situation. Julie, anything you want to add or any other final thought you want to Final yeah, one, one thing I would add quickly is um, I think it's also surprising to see the variability. And so in the data so far, there's enormous variability, you know, from all across Canada with different types of jobs. We've got a lot of workers right on the front line. Um, and as John said, you know, for some, we're getting feedback that, you know, they're, they're really enjoying the time with their families and there's some really positive things. And for others, um, there's some really grounding really you know high levels it's unbelievable what some people are currently going through and our hearts go out to people um, from across Canada but I think it really illustrates the fact that this is it's not the same for any one family and when we're hearing about what um, people are coping with it's so very different across each home um, and I think that's why it's really great that we're able to collect this data for you know, at least three months, maybe more, in order to really get a really comprehensive understanding of that variability and the techniques and tools that we can start to leverage to help people. Uh, I, I'd love to keep this going, but unfortunately, we're gonna we're gonna have to wrap it up. Uh, Julie and, and John, I, I want to thank you. This has been uh, incredibly valuable. I can see uh, I need to work on my breaks. Uh, <clears throat> I'm also a little upset to learn that I've never been a very good multitasker and apparently I'm not going to get any better <laughs> um, with practice. So um, yeah, I need to stay focused. And I think particularly your advice on how to help everybody else. And the reality is uh, you know, how we all get through this is going to be a test and a measure of our community. Uh, and, and we really do need to uh, support each other and, uh, your points, Julie, that, you know, everybody's situation is different. Uh, and, and we often don't really know what people's personal situation is. Uh, and, and so, you know, the solutions for different people are going to be different as well. Uh, so, so let me uh, thank you very much. Um, this was our, our first in this webinar series. The technology is, is different, but I'm sure you will all agree with me. Uh, it is the same quality of insights, uh, the same sort of insights that uh, cut through the noise uh, that, that we can provide to our, our community. Uh, and I can't think of a more relevant topic than the one we had today. Um, one of the questions, there were a lot of questions about how we deal with this in the workplace. Uh, and so I just want to tell you that the topic uh, for the next webinar, uh, which will be led by uh, Jeff Leonardelli at the Rotman School, who's an expert in, in team dynamics, uh, the next topic will be um, leading a remote workforce, creating co cohesion uh, during the crisis. So we're going to take this from our personal lives uh, very directly to our work lives uh, in the next in the next one. So, um, we, as I as I said, we are going to post this. Uh, John and, and and Julie, thank you again, and I want to thank everybody from jo for joining us. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Take care, stay safe, uh, and uh, I really hope you have everything you need. As Julie says, stay connected to your friends, uh, and uh, uh, we will get through this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.